Bonjour mesdames et messieurs, merci d'avoir patienté et bienvenue à la conférence téléphonique des résultats du premier trimestre de 5 n Plus Inc. de 2020. Présentement, toutes les lignes des participants sont en mode écoute seulement. Après la présentation, il y aura une période de questions et réponses. Pour poser une question, appuyez sur étoile puis 1 sur votre clavier téléphonique. Si vous avez besoin d'aide, veuillez appuyer sur étoile 0. Je vais maintenant céder la parole à Richard Perron, chef de la direction financière. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by and welcome to the 5 and Plus Inc. First Quarter 2020 Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a lesson-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I will now like to turn the conference over to your speaker today, Richard Perron, Chief Financial Officer. Please go ahead. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our first quarter ended March 31st, 2020 Financial Results Conference Call. We'll begin with an overview of our business performance, and review of our financial results, after which we will begin the question period. Joining me this morning is Arjan Roshan, our President and Chief Executive Officer. We issued yesterday our financial statements and we have posted a short presentation on the investors section of our website. I would like to draw your attention to slide two of the presentation. Information in this presentation and remarks made by the speakers today will contain statements about expected future events and financial results that are forward-looking and therefore subject to risk and uncertainties. A description of the risk factors that may affect future results is contained in our management's discussions and analysis available on our website and in our public filings. The company is not aware of any significant changes to its risk factors previously disclosed. However, since January 2020, the gradual outbreak of the novel strain of the coronavirus COVID-19 and its eventual declaration as a pandemic by the World Health Organization has resulted in governments worldwide enacting emergency measures to combat the spread of the virus. These measures have caused material disruption to business globally, resulting in an economic slowdown. The outbreak of the COVID-19 should be considered a new risk factor. In the analysis of our quality results, you will note that we've used and discussed certain non-IFRS measures, which definitions may differ from those used by other companies. For further information, please refer to our management discussion and analysis. I would like now, I would now like to turn the conference call to Arjan for the discussion on the business performance and quarter results. Arjan. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to 5M Plus conference call. Uh, I hope you and your families are doing well wherever you are and are remaining healthy and safe. Richard and I are uh, conducting this call from two separate locations, so if there's a bit of a lag or cross-communication, um, that's, that's the culprit, that's where it's coming from. I'll start by saying that in 2020, prior to the full-blown pandemic, we had already set course for a year with notable achievements. As of today, we have not given up on that mission. In addition, we believe we have the inherent obligation to make sure we do our part Within the, global, uh, within the larger global ecosystem and protect the continuity of supply for all customers of 5M+, many of whom, uh, many of our customers have been designated as essential businesses and uh, producers of critical materials in the fight against COVID-19. Early this year, 5M+, took decisive actions to further protect its employees and operations around the globe. We've been working closely with government agencies in various regions, implementing specific measures as for given jurisdictions. I think it's fair to assume that some of these measures have adversely impacted the company's operating efficiency. However, we believe these measures as a whole are protecting the health and safety of our people and enabling our operations to continue and serve our customers. <clears throat> Obviously, we remain vigilant as the situation remains fluid and we'll do the utmost to anticipate and address other challenges that may still loom ahead. 
Last night, Five and Plus posted results for the first quarter of 2020. Adjusted EBITDA for uh, for the quarter came in at 6.9 million versus 5.6 for the same period last year. Return on capital employed increased from 8.2% in Q1 2019 to 10.6% in Q1 2020. Revenue for the quarter reached 50 million as compared to 51.4 million for the same period last year. We are encouraged by how we have started the year, and despite added challenges from COVID-19, 5M Plus continues to make progress. As you may recall, last year 5M Plus announced that the contribution from refining and recycling activities, or what we call upstream activities, were expected to substantially decline for several quarters. This was largely driven by key suppliers withholding their materials due to continued drop in metal notations, reaching levels not seen in many years. Since launching 5N21 strategic plan, our upstream activities have grown faster and more profitable than initially expected. While in the years prior to 5N21, the vast majority of the key metals used as consumables in the company's products were procured as commercial grade metal a couple of years after implementing 5M21. Less than a third of these metals were procured as commercial metal and the balance of the needed metals were procured from the newly established upstream activities, which utilizes metallurgical processes to valorize these metals at more favorable conditions versus commercial metal purchases. In our second quarterly communication last year, we estimated that going forward, the adverse impact of the reduction in contribution from upstream activities to be about 15 to 20 percent of adjusted EBITDA. When we compare Q1 2020 to the same period last year, we can indeed validate this figure. This being said, the adverse impact is not immediately evident in our overall Q1 2020 earnings because the margin, the, the earnings growth in the downstream businesses more than compensated for this gap as reflected in the 23% growth in adjusted EBITDA. <clears throat> so now let's turn our attention to the downstream businesses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Earnings for eco-friendly, for segment eco-friendly materials remain flat for the quarter as compared to the same period last year. As mentioned earlier, this includes the adverse impact from upstream activities. Furthermore, 5M Plus experienced certain headwinds due to COVID-19, including mandatory shutdown of its Chinese activities during the quarter, which was rapidly brought back online within a few weeks. During the quarter, the volume demand for industrial materials was higher than the same period last year. The overall revenue was lower due to metal to lower metal notations as compared to the same period last year. Considering some of the end applications associated with industrial materials, including automotive and aerospace, which have been heavily impacted by the pandemic, we expect Q2 to be slower. Revenue for health and pharmaceutical materials were slightly lower for the quarter as compared to the same period last year. Over the past 12 months, 5M Plus has made tangible progress in qualifying its additive materials at certain key customers. 5M Plus is expanding its product offerings in this area to capture more synergies from its newly developed competencies. This should also enable its customers to benefit from streamlining their purchasing activities. In the next quarters, the growth of this activity will depend on how the pandemic will impact qualification campaigns at our customers. In Q1 2020, revenue for catalytic and extractive materials grew significantly as compared to the same period last year. As many of you know, in 2019, 5M Plus experienced production challenges, much of which were resolved by late 2019. This development 
along with a full order book, position the company to start 2020 on the right foot and fully serve its customer demands, yielding stronger performance in the quarter. The performance of this activity over the next quarters will depend on further development in mining, petrochemical, oil and gas industries. Despite mandatory shut, uh, shutdowns of certain mines, the demand for the company's products remains strong. Earnings for segment eco, uh, for, I'm sorry, earnings for segment electronic materials was significantly better than the same period last year. During the quarter, our Malaysian site underwent mandatory shutdown. Other plants in this segment remain open, some of them due to essential business classification. Within renewable energy, revenue was lower than the same period last year, while margins were notably higher driven by both volume and favorable mix. We expect Q2 demand to be similar. Revenue in security, aerospace, sensing, and imaging grew significantly with higher margins as compared to the same period last year. As you may recall, during 2019, 5M Plus faced production challenges associated with ramp up of certain specialty semiconductor materials. As of Q1 2020, nearly all production challenges have been resolved. This, along with uh, strong demand for infrared medical and security markets have resulted in significantly better earnings despite challenges in the space market. We expect this trend to continue in the next quarter. Revenue for technical materials were lower during the quarter as compared to the same period last year. The pandemic has significantly slowed product qualification campaigns and the demand for microelectronics industry has been adversely impacted. We expect the next few quarters to remain challenging. 5N Plus entered 2020 with ample cause for optimism, driven by the strength of the company's order book and the efficacy of its activities. A few weeks into the new year, the pandemic started to add notable uncertainty. During the quarter, 5M Plus was forced to temporarily close two of its facilities while other facilities remain operational. How the year will continue to develop will depend on the demand for our customers' products, our customers' ability to produce these products, and our ability to seamlessly serve our customers. Fortunately, the business of many of our customers has been identified as essential and many of our activities share the same classification. This will be helpful in allowing us to serve these markets. Nevertheless, even with the essential classification and utmost efforts to protect employees and operations, production disruptions due to COVID-19 virus remain a possibility. In addition, we're finding the current environment particularly challenging for new business development, which often requires close human interactions, along with qualification campaigns at our customers. Recognizing these uncertainties, we have decided to adopt a prudent practice by many companies and temporarily refrain from providing earnings guidance. This being said, it may be helpful to mention that prior to the pandemic, we had estimated 25 to 35% growth in adjusted EBITDA going from 2019 to 2020. This range would already account for the previously mentioned unfavorable upstream conditions. Over the past several quarters, our company has been going through a transformation process which has entailed migration toward enabling products with better margins, enhanced cost structure, improved productivity, bolstered balance sheet, rationalized capital employed, and ultimately an acceptable balance between risk and reward. I think we can agree that these are fundamental management principles. 
and is the case with many fundamental management principles, they're often overlooked or taken for granted and are undervalued until a crisis occurs, and then it is these very fundamentals which will determine which businesses will emerge and perhaps thrive and which will suffer. Unfortunately, COVID-19 virus has caused one of such crises. I am very glad that over the past few years, 5M Plus has invested time and resources to strengthen our fundamentals. I have no doubt that this work will pay dividend and believe we are well positioned to not only navigate through the current global pandemic, but most importantly, emerge stronger and more competitive than ever before. At this point, I'd like to turn the call over to Richard in sunny Montreal. <coughs> Thanks, AJ. So good morning, everyone. As mentioned by AJ, following a staging year impacted by metal notations, 5N Plus entered 2020, rapidly implementing strategic measures to protect our global workforce from the COVID-19 virus, endeavoring to mitigate any long-term impact of the pandemic on our business. We believe we have and can continue to successfully navigate the crisis, maintaining strong demand for our core products, serving a diversity of markets, continuing to take calculated risk while progressing, albeit slower than anticipated, with the business development of our growth initiatives. During the quarter just completed, characterized by relative stability from most commodity prices and healthy demand, the company has been able to significantly improve profitability, reporting a solid quarter in terms of adjusted EBITDA, achieving most of its short-term business objectives, as well as managing cash diligently and operating expenses judiciously, ending the quarter once again with a solid balance sheet. Looking beyond confronting the immediate challenges of COVID-19, 5N Plus made important progress in the past years to address earnings volatility, significantly straightening its product portfolio while improving capabilities and efficiency further with recent investments expected to come online later this year, mitigating current challenging conditions for our upstream activities. So now starting with the coverage of revenue and gross margin of this quarter, in Q1, 2020 revenue decreased slightly when compared to the same quarter of last year, while gross margin reached 24.4% compared to 22.4% in Q1 of last year. Despite lower contribution from the upstream activities, reflecting the impact of lower metal notations, while overall downstream volume was higher. Not covering Adjusted EBITDA and EBITDA. This, quarter, this past quarter, the adjusted EBITDA was 6.9 million compared to 5.6 million in Q1 of last year, positively impacted by stable metal notations and our overall downstream volume mitigating the contribution shortfall from our act, upstream activities. The electronic material segments adjusted EBITDA increased by 1.7 million to 5.8 million, presenting an adjusted EBITDA margin of 29% compared to 20% in Q1 of last year. While eco-friendly reached 3.1 and an adjusted EBITDA margin of 10%, similar to last year. In terms of EBITDA, it reached 6.2 million compared to 4.2 million Q1 of last year. The increase mainly explained by the higher adjusted EBITDA, combined with lower share-based compensation expense, mitigating our foreign exchange and derivative loss. In Q1 of this year, operating earnings reached 3.6 million compared to 1.3 million Q1 of last year. Their earnings were 0.6 million in Q1 compared to a net loss of 1.1 million last year. Now looking at analyzed backlog and bookings, backlog is at March 31st, 2020, reached a level of 180 days of annualized revenue, a decrease of 55 days over the backlog and did December 31st, 2019. The decrease was mainly driven by the bankruptcy filing of one of our and customers of a customer within electronic materials, resulting in retroactive adjustment to the backlog in terms of dollar and days of sales. Bookings for the electronic materials decrease by 77 days from 89 days in Q4 of last year, uh, following the retroactive adjustment to the backlog in reference to the bankruptcy filing of a customer's customer within electronic materials. The bookings calculated by adding revenues to the increase or decrease in backlog for the period divided by the annualized year revenue are also negatively impacted. Bookings for the eco-friendly materials segment decreased by six days from 101 days to 
uh, in Q4 to 95 days this quarter. Quickly going through the expenses, depreciation, amortization in Q1 amounted to 3.1 million, similar to 2019. In Q1 of this year, seeing expenses were 4.9 million compared to 5.5 million for the same period of 19. In 2020, the expenses were positively impacted by federal exchange rates across most local currency denominated expenses when compared to 2019, as well as timing of certain expenses, like travel expenses. Share-based compensation expense in Q1 2020 amounted to 0.2 million compared to 1.1 million for the same period of 2019. Financial expense in Q1 amounted to 1.3 compared to 1.7 million in Q1 of last year. The decrease mainly due to imputed interest recognized as a non-cash expense related to the outstanding convertible debentures redeemed in March 19. Net of our loss in foreign exchange and derivatives compared to the same period last year. The company reported earnings before income taxes of 2.2 million in Q1 2020. Income tax expense in Q1 2020 was 1.6 compared to 0.8 million in Q1 of 19. Both periods were impacted by deferred tax assets applicable in certain jurisdictions. Covering liquidity, um, cash generated by operating expenses amounted to 0.7 in Q1 compared to cash use in operating expenses of 6.6 in Q1 of last year. Increase in funds from operation is mainly explained by the higher EBITDA. In Q1 2020, cash shoes and investing activities totaled 2.3 million compared to 2.8 million in Q1 of last year, mainly attributed to timing of additions to property, plant, and equipment. In Q1 of this year, cash from financing activities amounted to 3.8 million compared to 4.8 million in Q1 of last year. The small decrease is mainly explained by the net drawdown of 5 million. Uh, from the credit facility, when in Q1 of 19, the company completed a, a five-year unsecured subordinated term loan of 25 million, for which only 19.3 were used to redeem the, uh, the company's outstanding convertible unsecured subordinated debentures of 26 million Canadian. Since the beginning of 2020, the company has repurchased and canceled 771,200 common shares under the NCIB plan for an amount of 0.8 million, compared to 384. 1,379 common shares for an amount of 1 million during Q1 of last year. Now looking at gross and net debt, net debt after considering cash and cash equivalent increased by 3.1 million from 35 million at the end of December 31st, 38.1 million as at March 31st, 2020. Mostly impacted by the drawdown of 5 million on the company's credit facility for working capital purposes. This will conclude the financial review. We are ready to take questions from analysts. Thank you. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please wait while we compile the questions. Your first question comes from the line of Macwell with Cartmark Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, nice progress on the margins. Um, I'm wondering, when you look at the changes you made over the course of the last year dealing with some of the uh, startup issues and, and that you've talked about. Do you, how has it shifted sort of your direct versus indirect costs? I'm wondering whether you could speak, the reason I ask it, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the sensitivity of the margins in a slowdown because it would be helpful to get an idea of, of, of how you're impacted um, operationally on the slowdown of shipments. Okay, um, on a slowdown of the shipments. Um, well, I'm just saying, if you're if you're just slowing down, if what's happening is you're still operating and you're still getting good operating margin, but you're just not able to ship, and you're going to see a slowdown, a disruption due to customer demand, and you're not shipping. How how should we see that manifest itself? Like, do your you you've got a different direct versus indirect cost than before, and I'm wondering or whether you do or not. I'm just wondering how we should be thinking of that in terms of our modeling. Yeah, well, it depends. Uh, the scenario you're describing, it depends how long it lasts. Uh, but in the first few quarters, what you'll see is uh, we're not likely to uh, stop production. So what you see is an increase in our inventory and and at um, and the current inventory is in good health and the coming quarters, even if for some reason clients are asking to delay shipments, uh, we see no reason why that inventory could not could not continue to be at at, at profitable at, at at market and better. 
Okay. So okay. we need the scenario describing. We need to extend like way beyond one, two, and likely to say three quarters. But if for some reason it really slows down, like for like three quarters, what will likely happen is we'll have extended maintenance shutdowns toward the end of the right. year type of scenario, not right, to impact right. quality of the 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 economic of our invent, inventory on hand. But we're not okay. we would not stop production and impact margins as as you. There are a lot okay. in the first few quarters of a something that would drag over a very long period of time. Okay, that's helpful. I mean, so in reading that answer, in, in sort of parsing it, it sounds as if you're not counting on that level of disruption, like three this point, plus quarters. No, no, we, no, not yeah. yeah. We we're not anticipating. We're not. Sorry again for cross communication. We're not anticipating it based on at least what we see. Remember, part. Um, one of the things that helps us is um, some of the things we do is actually essential in this environment. Uh, or we have a, a, a fairly good list of customers that carry that classification. So that is, I guess, part of it. Uh, but we have indeed, uh, in the background, we've done a contingency planning for, let's say, the worst case. Uh, as Richard mentioned, um, you know, we 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 can withstand the worst case for a very long time, based on the resources we have in the company, based on our uh, strength of our balance sheet. Um, so we'll be able to go for 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 many many months on this. Okay. Okay. And then looking at the backlog, um, in terms of it, uh, I'm wondering what the terms of of it are. And what I'm looking for is some insight into uh, when you get when you go through a quarter on some of that business, uh, if you don't get a follow-on order, uh, is that lost revenue or is it delayed? And I'm wondering a little bit because if you can you can imagine in something like food additives, if if, if that hasn't been purchased, it's going into feed. Those animals don't need to be fed twice as much next year. So that's just it's gone, right? So I'm wondering whether that not whether that is or not the case for a lot of the other businesses. So, so I think um, um, I would encourage us to look at, at certainly our backlog number a little bit differently uh, because the major influence here is not really uh, uh, is not necessarily the question of whether we've uh, won the business or not with a customer. It has to do with co uh, contract cycles. Remember, we look. 12 months out, um, and um, we are a company that supplies to many industries and have a fairly long list of clients, and they all have their patterns, purchasing powder, uh, patterns. Um, they have We have a mixture of long and short-term contracts. Um, sometimes, and I've, I think I've said this in the past, sometimes um, you may be getting to a point where with you know, a, a portfolio of contracts that 12 months is running out at that, uh, meaning your long-term contract is coming to term and you have to renew that. Now, <clears throat> when that happens, there's still another uh, unknown and the unknown is, will the customer themselves want to go long-term contract or not? And then there's another unknown, whether 5N want to go long-term or not. And obviously in those negotiations, it all depends what benefits you. So. Uh, when you look at our backlog number, I understand that it's gone to 188. <clears throat> we consider that actually a very good uh, backlog number. Um, I am not aware of that being influenced materially by uh, loss of business or, or adverse impact. Uh, I am, uh, to the best of my knowledge, everything that I see has to do with contract cycles certain contract cycles, uh, and then whether we will renew them or not. Now, um, I actually expect that number right now not to go higher, it might even go lower in the next quarters. And, and if, it, if it does go lower, and it is because of the contract cycle, I'm not too terribly concerned, because I think given the, the current condition, uh, we have to weigh our options, and our customers are weighing our options. Do we uh, lock things for 12 months? Or do we do we uh, go on more of a 
short term or even spot um, practice. Those are those are decisions that needs to be made, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna be prudent how we make those decisions. So uh, you know, just for me to show a good backlog number to the market, uh, and this is the probably the danger with this backlog number. Sometimes it, it it projects a really good image, and sometimes it doesn't. But the fact is, it's also a choice in terms of whether uh, you decide to go long term with your contracts or not. I don't yeah, know if that explained it. Yeah, that that's helpful because that, that makes sense, right? Like to to sort of warn us not to read the same thing from it that we had in the past. Because if your customers, exactly as you say, if your customers are adjusting, saying, well, we don't really know, you don't want to get locked in either way. You don't want to enter into a bad contract simply because, I mean, because you can't tell what's happening. And you may see it all come back very rapidly. It's possible. Exactly. And and, and um, being a publicly traded company, and I'll, I'll put this out there so that it's very clear, uh, we don't want this to be what... Uh, uh, what determines our behavior uh, because we may get involved in a negotiation that will be protracted because we just simply don't want to accept certain terms and uh, uh, we we do that because we think the customer at the end of the day has to buy the product now whether they do it on long term or spot um, you know they're going to need that product uh, and so we may even, uh, you know, protract some of these discussions until, you know, we think the position that we're in is adequate for us. So, so if, if again, if, if this number were to go further down, I uh, and, and and if the reason is exactly what I said and not loss of business, uh, I certainly wouldn't be concerned about it. Okay, that's great. I'll, I'll get back to you, but some other guys asked some questions. Thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Frédéric Tremblay with Desjardins. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. On the yeah. um, good morning on the um, the electronic materials segment in Q1, um, the favorable product mix was mentioned as a reason for the strength there. So, wondering if uh, if there was anything in there that was one time in nature, or or if it's part of the the planned ongoing evolution of the product mix, and how should we think about the impact of product mix on margins going forward, um, given the current demand environment? Well, um, I'll start and then maybe Richard can augment it. Um, when, when you look at electronic material, obviously that is the part of our business that by itself has, has better margins. Um, now, this, this particularly was the case um, in terms of uh, the, the, the better mix was the case in renewable and in uh, in uh, SASE, uh, but obviously the production-related um, issues that were uh, impairing our ability to really demonstrate uh, the margins is primarily limited or in large part limited uh, in in um, uh, SASE because last year, as you recall, we had issues with production of a number of our uh, engineered materials. So. Um, I would say most of the operational improvements uh, comes from SASE, and the mix is shared between uh, between um, somewhat equally. I would even say between those two. Richard, do you have a, a better answer than that? No, no, that's fine. And it's uh, I don't think it's a one-time effect of Q1. You see that repeat uh, over the upcoming quarters. Uh, we'll have. Uh, Variation from one quarter to another, potentially, especially on the SASE uh, business. Uh, but 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 overall, we we should have this year a better mix than last year for different things that have evolved, developed. Great, thanks for that. Um, wanted to speak a bit on inventory management. Um, first, was wondering if you've seen any supply chain disruption, and. Um, and then, in terms of inventory management, you know, you mentioned AJ. Um, you know, in terms of the backlog, potentially some some customers or five and plus potentially electing to go, um, you know, shorter term or spot. Um, how does that potentially impact your your inventory management going forward? Um, you know, I think you you point to a, a, an important item that the, the the second point you made. Indeed. Um, when you have longer term contract uh, by default you're able to better 
commercially hedge. Our commercial hedging for us is actually a physical hedge. We physically secure those uh, those materials. So uh, indeed, you're correct. Um, when you have longer term, uh, when, when you secure longer term pro uh, uh, longer term contracts, you're able to uh, do a better job in terms of commercial hedging. So yes, you're you know um, if we go into more shorter term uh, situations, then uh, inventory management becomes more of a challenge. Uh, because you're you're essentially have to buy your inventory also somewhat uh, uh, you know on the spot. Uh, that being said, when we make those decisions, we try to uh, balance them against the, uh, balance the benefits against it. If you look at, for example, uh, you know the, the current metal market, some of the metals that we use extensively are at such low notations that uh, you know for us. We don't speculate on metal, but certainly in terms of dollar value going down versus going up, you know, there's limited exposure. So we're going to put that also into that equation. Um, in terms of uh, supply disruption, no, we did not have supply disruption. Uh, I uh, I won't <laughs> I won't say that it was easy because remember uh, our upstream. Uh, you know, the, the event that happened last year in upstream was pretty abrupt. It was quickly that uh, some things dried up and uh, it, it, it had an impact on us and we had to go and um, be able to still procure things without disrupting uh, the whole supply picture, the fundamentals within supply picture, creating, you know, uh, bubbles and whatnot. Uh, and I think our teams have done a, a, a fantastic job of doing that. Uh, and then you have to be able to obviously then manage against COVID-19, uh, be able to uh, continue to keep your supply chain intact. I think, again, our team has done a great job. Part of that obviously has to do with us having to build uh, sometimes some uh, buffer to be able to withstand uh, delays and whatnot. But overall, um, uh, we, you know, I think we've gone through this period without any interruption uh, in our supply chain. Great. And the uh, last question for me would be on the competitive environment. Um, do you think that the current uh, you know, COVID situation is, um, you know, is impacting some of your competitors? Is it creating some organic and inorganic opportunities for 5M Plus? Um, I guess I'll try to not say too much there uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, what I do know is that we have received additional inquiries. Um, I am not sure if that's got to do with COVID. I don't know if that has to do because some of them have uh, financial situations. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll just probably stay there. Understood. Thanks. Thanks for taking the question. Your next question comes from the line of Afan Khan with National Bank Financial. Please go ahead. Good morning. I'm calling on behalf of Rupert. Uh, so we wanted to get a better handle of taxation. Uh, it's fairly high this quarter. We understand it's from different jurisdictions. Good morning. Can, can you please speak up a little? I, I have a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry. Working from home is painful. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me better now? Yes, better. 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 Yeah. So... We just wanted to get a better handle of taxation. We understand it's coming from different jurisdictions, but can we get a sense of what a normalized run rate would look like moving forward? Okay. Um, uh, the difficulty with our business is the following. We're into, uh, I, don't know, nine, uh, I don't know, nine jurisdictions or so. Yeah. Uh, well, less than nine, but we have nine sites, okay? And uh, all sites uh, have their own product lines. And um, so the difficulty is that we may we may be uh, making more money with a certain product than others, or in some country rather than other. Um, so you cannot take the average tax rate of all the countries that we're operating in because uh, they're not all profitable at the same level, and they're they're definitely not at the same uh, with the same level of different taxes and other and other uh, tax opportunities. So. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand it's hard to modelize. Uh, uh, let's just say that 
Uh, by default, we have a couple of plants in Germany, so we tend to be more often taxed in Germany than other countries because we have two plants. Canada is obviously a core place, so I guess if you pick a rate somewhere between uh, Germany and Canada, uh, but then again, uh, <laughs> we're in so many different countries that. Uh, so, but but I don't have a I don't have an easy answer for you because it also varies from one quarter to another. But by default, we we do tend to pay uh, more taxes in in Germany and Canada than the other countries because of the our footprint. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, and just like one other follow up question, from our understanding, the customer was one web, not the customer, but the potential impact that uh, had an impact on the backlog. And if hypothetically, because those assets are garnering attention from tech heavyweight, would that, if that materializes, if that can open the door for renewed business opportunities. So. Uh, I'll try not to address any particular uh, clients, uh, even though OneWeb is in our client, it's a customer of a customer. Um, but I'll, I'll try to answer your questions. Um, I think I should uh, probably, uh, perhaps even correct myself to an earlier question, uh, uh, mm -hmm. because I said some of the changes in the, or the changes in backlog was a lot of it had to do with, uh, with contract, um, uh, situation uh, indeed there were uh, a bit of impact from uh, from uh, situation with our customers uh, we didn't lose business but obviously in this environment there are customers that potentially can go out of business and yes there was that impact there was some of that um, and if they come back online we'll we'll add the number or if, and then assuming the situation stands we'll uh, we'll you know that'll be an upside but uh, to the best of our knowledge, as soon as uh, um, you know, as soon as we get formal bankruptcy, bankruptcy protection notice, um, we have we, we adjust our numbers. Um, yeah, and and uh, just just to make it clear, in terms of exposure uh, to uh, to any ongoing bankruptcy files, it's limited uh, in terms of receivables and whatnot. Um, our teams are uh, have been really working diligently to make sure that, given the current COVID condition, that uh, uh, you know all credit lines, everything's being monitored very closely. And at this point, uh, we don't have uh, exposure that is, uh, you know, that would be significant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's really helpful. Hope you guys continue to be safe and healthy. We'll get back in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from the line of Nick Agostino with Laurie Bank. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, good morning. Uh, first, let me just say thank you for that color on the backlog. It was uh, really helpful to understand the, the dynamics between the short term and long term. On that same topic, uh, AJ, can you maybe give some color as to how much of the decision um, was on on five ends part versus your customers part when it came to you know going going short term in some cases and the reason I ask is to try to understand uh, how whether the backlog decline was a function of just lower visibility from your customers or maybe if it's five n um, equally recognizing that if we go short term with these contracts as you said earlier the demand will be there and maybe you see it as an opportunity to maybe pick up some some margin in, in the short term. So any split on that would be great. Okay, sure. Um, so perhaps I um, uh, perhaps I uh, didn't do a good job of, of explaining it. We haven't really, at this point, declared that we're going to go short term. Um, where we are is uh, you're looking at the next 12 months and uh, some of the contracts that require uh, renewal are beginning to fall in those last months and uh, we have started the process of depends on the client but we've started the process of uh, negotiation so um, I can't tell you that we have declared one way um, or the other in terms of uh, uh, in terms of whether we'll go short term or long term it, typically our posture is look um, you know if we can get the terms um, that we believe is 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 
you know what what it should be then then obviously this happens sooner if not we'll continue to negotiate um, my expectation I can only give you my expectation is that you're gonna in, in that number you're going to get a V you're going to get a V type of a, a situation where it's probably going to go down I, I I'm not sure if we're going to work everything out because remember as we're working to renew contracts um, uh, that the 12 month window is also moving the next quarter you've moved in three more months into that so I think we'll go into a V we'll go into the bottom and then at some point we'll come up um, when that happens uh, I don't know uh, that's my expectation now if it goes down and and stays down there because um, uh, then the question is did it happen because you know we lost business typically that hasn't been the case or is it because you know either parties have decided not to lock up uh, but I think it's too soon for that uh, discussion right now give us I would tell you two more quarters and I think we should have a better visibility on that I okay, appreciate that color and then my, my next question is you know when I look at uh, I guess the, the your metal price charts in your slide presentation, it looks like we, we saw a little bit of a flattening uh, through Q1. Can you do you have any color now that we are sitting here in the month of May? Any color on what's happening on the upstream supply? Is is COVID? You, know, you, you spoke in the past that some of the uh, suppliers may be holding on to metals in hopes of higher prices. Um, are you seeing any loose in there as an indication that maybe metal prices have started to recover uh, during in the last month or maybe financial situations are causing them to to uh, I guess uh, I guess give out their supply uh, regardless of where the uh, metal prices are so just the last five seconds I didn't uh, I didn't fully understand what you said but I think oh. I, I did it yeah, so I'm just wondering if, if uh, within the last month, if you've seen uh, a loosening of supply uh, on the upstream side. In other words, maybe prices are starting to bounce up a little bit, and more supplies, metal prices coming into the market from those that maybe were hoarding it in the past, or if possibly because of COVID, because of their financial situations, maybe they're having to to uh, I guess release supply into the market regardless of pricing. So any anything you guys are observing there would be appreciated. Okay, I'll, I'll try to do this without speculating and and infusing my prejudices. Um, uh, just to answer the last point, uh, no, we have not uh, uh, seen any uh, loosening on the supply on the on the on on behalf of our supplier in terms of. Uh, uh, bringing additional or getting um, access to additional um, feed material for refining and recycling activities. Uh, and now coming back to you know the basket of minor metals is a large basket and they all have their own dynamics. So let me limit this discussion at least to the two largest metals uh, that we deal with: that's bismuth and tellurium. Uh, I think the uh, the big item that we should keep in front of us is uh, last year in November we had the big auction, the Fania auction, um, where uh, somewhere for business about uh, 20,000 tons of this material was sold off, sold off within China uh, and the price if you know if you put in some uh, transactional costs in it is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, $2.20 a pound. I'm probably uh, not too far off, uh, bit here, bit there, uh, and so you've got yourself a, uh, I would say, a notable figure because 20,000 tons of bismuth is quite a bit. It's a year and a half of production or whatnot. So you've got that factor sitting there um, that um, clearly puts puts a bit of, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the ballast tank for bismuth kind of gets filled up with that with a 220. Um, and on tellurium, that number was 45. Now, tellurium has a, these metals have different dynamics. On tellurium side, the reserve had only, I think, four months of global uh, production. Uh, but um, obviously, that also set a notable number. So, 220 and 45 are things that, uh, on those two metals, that I think are notable. Um, 
we think that for obviously business to go up, uh, well, you know, there's always um, there's always um, behaviors that don't necessarily make sense from the market point of view. But if you purely look at it from the market point of view, I would say, you know, uh, I see little reason for it to necessarily go hugely higher at this point. And some of the, what's there needs to be consumed. Um, but that being said, again, uh, within this space, certain uh, players can hoard or or get government help or whatnot and, and drive the price up, albeit uh, temporarily. On uh, the tellurium side, uh, similar situation. There's, 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 uh, to the best of our knowledge, these materials are available. So this is why uh, last year when we um, when we brought the whole situation with upstream uh, to your attention, we mentioned that we don't expect this to be something that will immediately resolve itself. Certainly after FANIA occurred, it, this reconfirmed our belief uh, that, uh, that this would be more pro, uh, you know, protracted. Um, so the way we are modeling ourselves is we're not counting uh, on necessarily uh, seeing the, the, you know, the, our current situation change, and, and I think we're okay with that because I think even in the given uh, current situation, uh, if we continue to work, uh, make sure we bring, you know, competitively procure metal, uh, albeit not as much from upstream, but, uh, you know, from buying metal for metal, and then continue to grow our downstream businesses, we should be able to continue to provide earnings growth. Well, in a non-COVID-19 environment, and we'll see what the impact of COVID is. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes on the line of Maxwell with Carmark Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, just a, a, a quick question on the um, on the the trials you had in the micro powder segment. You had a fair number of customers looking at that material. Is and I know you talked about new business is challenging because you need to be sort of face-to-face, -face. but with those projects or programs that are well advanced where they're doing the evaluation, are those continuing? Like, should they not be able to continue and maybe not face as much of a, of a delay as, as we might expect? So we have two factors here. We've had uh, customers that, had, uh, that were planning uh, new products. They have delayed some of their plans. And then we've got uh, exactly what you mentioned. Us generally qualifying with customers and you're right um, they are uh, there are files that uh, that are advanced enough that are continuing it's not an issue the comment we made primarily has to do with uh, developing new files being able to because this is a growth initiative you know um, you, you need to continue to generate new files you need to continue to uh, put as many balls up as you can and right now we're, we're, if I'm honest, we're struggling with that because our people can't travel. We can't really, uh, uh, really sit there and, and entertain new, uh, new discussions around new applications that are coming. Uh, the visibility from our customers is also fairly uh, poor. We, we, we don't necessarily get to see right now what's happening within the larger scope of, uh, especially within um, electronics industry. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. And there are no further questions at this time. I will turn the call back over to the presenters for closing remarks. Well, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. Safe. Thank you very much. Yes. Be safe. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.